Are you conducting me through to a QI? That's what I'm um, getting right now is seeing who is uh, on call, and I'm going to get you right to them. Give me one second, sir. I'm going to put you on a quick hold. So one moment, please. Your rank? Ship's master. Okay, thank you. Ship's name? Spell follow. Spell that? E-L. Oh, man. The t the the clock is ticking. Can I please speak with a QI? Got it, Ben. Again, uh, I'm going to give you reach right now. One moment, please. Hi, good morning. My name is Just give me one moment. I'm going to try to connect you now, okay? Mr. Davidson? Okay. Okay, one moment, please. Hi, thank oh you for waiting. Oh, my God. Just really briefly, what is, your, um, what is the problem you're having? I have a marine emergency, and I would like to speak to a QI. We had a, a, a hull breach, a scuttle blew open during a storm. We have water down in three holes with a heavy lift. We've lost the main propulsion unit. The engineers cannot get it going. Can I speak with a QI, please? Yes, thank you so much. One moment. Originally known as the MV Puerto Rico, the El Faro was hole number 670, completed in 1975 by Sunship out of Chester, Pennsylvania. Ownership changed hands multiple times. In 91, the vessel's name changed to Northern Lights, then in 06 renamed to El Faro, or the Lighthouse in Spanish. Much of this was essentially reorganizations of the original Totem Ocean Trailer Express out of Tacoma, Washington, eventually becoming Tote Maritime out of Jacksonville, Florida. Operated by Sea Star Line, a subsidiary of Tote Maritime and registered in San Juan, Puerto Rico, the vessel specs were a length of 790 feet, a width or beam of 92 feet, a draft of 20 to 29 feet, and a height of roughly 157 feet above the waterline. A GE steam turbine power plant generated 30,000 shaft horsepower to a single screw. This provided a top speed, in its original configuration, of roughly 25 knots. The ship would have a crew capacity of roughly 30 to 35. With a gross tonnage of about 17,500, the El Faro had a net capacity, or the ability to carry, up to about 11,400 tons, between containers and roll-on roll-off trailers and vehicles. It would have a replacement value of 36 million US dollars. This vessel and her sister ships El Moro, the Nose, El Yunque, the Anvil, Great Land, and Westward Venture, all of the same era, were Ponce de Leon class vessels, a unique class of ship exclusively from Sunship, also known at the time as trailer ships. Built originally for roll-on roll-off cargo, under typical charters, semi-trailers rather than stacked containers comprise the majority of cargo carried on the main deck. Railroads of all kinds have been fraught with issues historically, for many different reasons. Crews lacking in seafaring knowledge, lacking maintenance, vessel instability due to modifications, and that's just to name a few giving rise to the type's nickname in the industry, Roll On, Roll Over. While operating in Totes Alaska routes, the El Faro, still the trailer ship Northern Lights at the time, would receive what the Coast Guard determined was a major conversion in 1992. Atlantic Marine Shipyard in Mobile, Alabama, by the owner's request, would install a large mid-body insert that allowed more cargo on Deck 2 and a raised platform atop the main deck, referred to by the NTSB and Coast Guard as a spar deck creating an additional ramped level allowing more trailers to be carried. This required an offset of 1,830 tons of additional semi-permanent or fixed ballast in the form of iron ore filling two bottom tanks. The vessel would run totes Alaskan routes in this configuration until roughly 06. As times change though, the proliferation of the cargo container and intermodal transportation, moving them relatively quickly between ship, rail, and road, became nearly impossible for shippers to ignore. The monetary benefits and in some ways necessity, at least if you want to keep up with the market, the pressure to haul as many as possible, it's become a global phenomenon. Many container ships of today were various other platform types modified to meet this demand. Bit of a side note here, prior to becoming the El Faro in 06, the Tote Company assisted in Operation Iraqi Freedom in 03. The Northern Lights, chartered by the US Military Sealift Command, hauled Marine Corps rolling stock, war equipment, and materials for rebuilding in Iraq. In 06, when the vessel's name was changed to El Faro, and as with other Sea Star Line Ponce class vessels, it would be converted from Ro Ro to Ro Con, or Conro, 
a roll-on, roll-off container ship hybrid of sorts. The work performed again by Atlantic Marine Shipyard in Mobile. With the mezzanine-type platform removed, the main deck would be made compatible with today's most common, general-purpose containers, and especially electric refrigerated containers, crucial to Puerto Rico's food-grade product supply chain coming from mainland U.S. Vehicle stowage would remain below, spread out between decks 2, 3, and 4. The main deck needed heavy reinforcement, though, and support foundations, to accommodate stacked containers for this now lift-on-lift-off configuration, or LOLO. This added even more weight regardless of removing the platform and ramps. This and the additional cargo carried on the main deck would raise the center of gravity further, requiring even more fixed ballast in bottom tanks, another 4,875 tons of iron ore. However, this time the Coast Guard and its Marine Safety Center, or MSC, wouldn't consider this a major conversion like they did with the modifications back in 92. They'd intended to when the project was initially proposed, but towed or totem at the time. Their vice president of marine operations sent multiple requests urging the MSC to reconsider. According to the MSC, when a vessel undergoes a major conversion, it's considered a new vessel and must be brought back into compliance with all standards on the contract date of the conversion. Given the potential cost and schedule of a major conversion determination, MSC recommends that vessel owners seek a determination early in the planning process. Requirements like Drawings showing before and after vessel conditions. Description of modifications including changes to length, beam, depth, height, light ship displacement, dead weight capacity, passenger capacity, and on and on. It becomes obvious the short-term advantages for a company looking to skirt these regulations. The 06 modifications would significantly increase cargo capacity, change the vessel's maximum allowable draft by an increase of over two feet, reduce freeboard which lowered hull openings closer to the waterline due to the much lower load line, all major stability changes. Despite all this though, the MSC pulled their proposal to class this as a major conversion, as was the case previously in similar conversions with the El Yunque and El Moro. A former master with 25 years experience captaining these Ponce class vessels in later testimony stated, the Sea Star ships when you talk about structure, they were row cons, so the containers were on the upper decks and with a heavy load of cargo, they would be a tender ship as opposed to a stiffer ship. A tender ship is a little bit more of a different animal to handle, especially in rough conditions." End quote. The differences between what's referred to as a stiff ship versus a tender ship in the world of seafaring are quite substantial. From FAO.org, a stiff vessel tends to be comparatively difficult to heal and will roll from side to side very quickly and perhaps violently. The terms violently and quickly used in this instance because its power to return to horizontal is so great that it happens immediately, and a tender vessel will be much easier to incline and will not tend to return quickly to upright. The time period taken to roll from side to side will be comparatively long. This condition is not desirable and can be corrected by lowering the vessel's center of gravity. The master would go on to say, What I observed with the ship was a very slow return. You could feel the ship list, lean over, even as she rolled from a rudder command alone let alone rolling with a heavy swell. And because it was slow to ride itself, you could feel the ship respond with more difficulty. And there's always a concern that she's not going to ride herself adequately for other conditions." End quote. According to the NTSB's contact at Tote Maritime though, the El Faro was laid up soon after the 06 renaming and modifications anyhow. The vessel sitting mostly dormant from 08 through 2014, only re-entering service briefly for a Philadelphia route in 2010. A route tote maritime soon eliminated, sending the El Faro back into mothball status. Being laid up, of course, has a meaning that's easy to understand. Laid up vessels are those not underway, mothballed for long durations, not in use, idle at port for extended periods, and so on, basically in storage. While this is a simple definition, the process of laying up vessels of this size properly is actually much more complex, and every vessel's owner and operator may handle it differently some responsibly, some not so much, something that will play a crucial role later. The El Faro was brought back into service in May of 2014 to relieve the outgoing El Moro and run to its weekly round trip between Jacksonville and San Juan, alongside El Yunque, still assigned to the route. Rarely do these incidents stem from a single error gone wrong or boil all the way down to a single party entirely to blame. The El Faro tragedy was a prime example of such a long chain of failures. 
In late summer of 2015, Tote was two years into a corporate reorganization yet again. Sea Star Line was planned to eventually be absorbed and become part of Tote proper, but in the meantime, the main focus of leadership in these groups was on the up-and-coming, world-first, liquid natural gas or LNG-powered, Marlin-class container ships, Isla Bea or Beautiful Island, and Perla del Caribe or Caribbean Pearl. The Ponce-class fleet would take a backseat to these new flagships of sorts, with Tote reassigning office and engineering personnel from management of the old ships to focus on the Marlin-class fleet. For example, a director of safety and services, previously from the Ponce fleet, had been tasked with direct oversight of the LNGs as they were being prepped for use. All of this left critical shortages in the onshore workforce managing the Ponce vessels and still bustling Jacksonville to San Juan operations in general. In command of the El Faro at this time in 2015, the ship's master, Captain Michael Davidson, 53 years old, was a man of commanding presence, but not much interest in the minute details of ship operations, according to several colleagues. Known by some as a stateroom captain, one that commands from arm's length, so to speak. Davidson and his previous employer of roughly three years, Crowley Maritime, parted ways in 2013, the captain stating that he'd resigned, others reporting he'd been fired. Regardless, in a first for the aspiring captain, he was given the position of master at Crowley. Later on, when a large vessel under his command showed signs of disrepair and was unable to steer under its own power safely, Davidson ordered two tugs to move the ship safely into port, reportedly against the wishes of his former employer. This said to be the reason he and Crowley parted ways. Starting at Tote as third mate in May of 2013, Davidson would climb the ranks quickly, achieving his first vessel command by that summer. The quote, sudden termination of senior officers on the Rocon sister vessel El Moro provided this opportunity for Davidson until his command changed to El Faro in May of 2014. The El Moro scrapped soon after El Faro took over that same year. In addition to the sudden termination of officers aboard El Moro, there had also been much drama surrounding the Ponce fleet command structure in general. The Ponce vessels, earning a reputation of being rust buckets, meant the up-and-coming Marlin-class vessels caused a good bit of turmoil amongst those, quote, still stuck, manning the old fleet. In summer of 2015, two Ponce masters suddenly resigned, one from El Yunque and another from El Faro. Each ship has more than one master, alternating and allowing for time off, etc. The master that resigned from El Faro stating he did so due to, quote, all the drama that is going on aboard El Faro. This was amongst, around roughly the same time, Chief mates caught sleeping on the bridge while underway, lax training, evaluation, and maintenance practices, safety equipment and drills severely lacking on all the older ships. It was beginning to take a toll on the entire Ponce fleet from a mechanical and personnel standpoint. I suspect these were factors in El Moro scrapping. All of these older vessels were, by this point, tired. Tropical Storm Erica formed in late August, and, out of an abundance of caution, the El Faro chose an alternate route during a routine voyage to San Juan. Captain Davidson, in an email to management, stating, The El Faro will transit the Old Bahama Channel en route to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Although this route does add an additional 160 miles, I am confident that it offers a safer sea passage compared to our normal offshore route. End quote. This would cause a delay in delivery, but they would safely avoid the developing tropical storm. Important to note here is that despite Tote's many shortcomings, that we'll continue to discuss later, and despite their reputation and company motto, on time every time, management would respond to Captain Davidson's heads up with approval and without hesitation. Thanks Captain Mike, good plan, stay safe. Tropical Storm Erica dissipated on September 3rd, and the El Faro delivered without further issue. The 2015 hurricane season, though, wouldn't end there. Monday, September 28th, docked at Blunt Island, Jacksonville, Florida. The El Faro would offload mostly empty containers returning from San Juan and begin taking on a near full load of cargo for the return voyage. Containers, vehicles, trailers, and more. The crew consisted of 27 Sea Star Line personnel, and Toad had plans for yet another conversion to the El Faro. It was due to be sent back to Alaska routes in the potential future, so much of the related deck, electrical, and piping work was being performed with the vessel underway. Performing this work was a group of five Polish nationals known in the industry as a riding crew, a group of contractors on board since August, performing this work separately, 
while the vessel carried on with routine voyages. They would be supervised by an experienced engineering representative from Tote. Six personnel on the riding crew total, this brought the total souls aboard the El Faro to 33. Loading would continue the morning of Tuesday the 29th, and it was around 10 a.m. that an off-duty El Faro second mate texted Captain Davidson letting him know about the storm forming north of the Bahamas. That afternoon, a tote terminal manager on the docks noticed the greatest list he'd ever seen during a loading operation and that the El Faro wasn't recovering. Later determined to have been about 4 degrees once caught, this was corrected immediately with the dock crews adjusting some loaded containers to the port side, correcting the list. At 4.51 p.m., the National Hurricane Center announced the possibility of Tropical Storm Joaquin becoming a hurricane the next day, Wednesday the 30th. Followed up by issuing a warning area across 73,000 square nautical miles east of the Bahamas. When asked by the off-duty second mate at about 6.30 p.m., again via text message, asking, what's your plan? The captain simply replied he intended to steam our normal direct route and that Joaquin would remain north of us. When pressed by the same second mate once again in another text message, we have routes suggesting options like Mayagana, Crooked Island, and others known to be alternates to avoid storms, including those the vessel can easily duck into mid-voyage if necessary. Although technically responsible for voyage routes, tote second mates still required shipmaster review and approval to put them into use. 7.30 p.m. Tuesday the 29th and the El Faro was loaded, pulling away from the pier by 8.07 with 241 food grade containers, 238 of which were refrigerated or reefers, 118 trailers, 149 vehicles, 391 standard shipping containers, a few miscellaneous items like cargo on pallets, and 600 tons of fructose in container tanks or tank tainers, 11,046 tons of cargo total on board. By the time they pulled away, the Jacksonville port was under Hurricane Condition 4 per Coast Guard orders. The El Faro regularly made use of pilot services to navigate the St. John's River ship channel. As they made their way toward open water, the pilot, a seasoned mariner himself, brought up in conversation the storm building in the Atlantic. We're just going to go out and shoot under it, Captain Davidson responded. The pilot noticed no reactions to this from bridge crew within earshot. Nearing 11 p.m. now and about an hour after the pilot disembarked, the El Faro fully underway in open water, the government of the Bahamas issued a hurricane watch for the central Bahamas, predicting Joaquin to take a west-southwesterly path. By 6 a.m. Wednesday the 30th, the hurricane watch had been upgraded by the Bahamas to a warning for the island's general area, and it was around this time the U.S. Air Force Reserve 53rd Reconnaissance Squadron dispatched a hurricane hunting WC-130 along with NOAA's WP-3D Orion. They would team up in monitoring Joaquin in real time. As the ship steamed ahead on their typical southeasterly track toward San Juan, Captain Davidson and the chief mate discussed the storm's predicted paths on the bridge. The ship's onboard weather system, the Bon Voyage system, or BVS, sent graphical weather updates to the captain's email every six hours. His latest update at 5.04 a.m. was consistent with forecasts and predictions from the National Hurricane Center, or NHC, issued late afternoon the previous day. The cone of uncertainty, essentially the potential path atmospheric equipment and experts project a hurricane to take, was now very clearly, based on current advisories, covering a swath of ocean directly in the ship's path, but info used by El Faro in the BVS, if delayed enough, may have still been consistent with the NHC's advisory number 6, errantly predicting Joaquin to turn north before the NHC had made their forecast corrections. The ship sat sea terminal, a satellite terminal that allows two-way communication via data packet transfer, also received updates around 6.38 a.m. showing the current position of the storm center, with reports of wind gusts up to 75 knots now. The sun was rising, and after reviewing this information with the chief mate, the captain was heard saying with a yawn, Oh, look at that red sky over there. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. Clearly not concerned with any of the weather information being discussed. He and the chief mate talked about a slight course change to the west of San Salvador, but still within or near their typical track. The captain referring to the alternate safer course options saying, yeah, it doesn't warrant it. You can't run every single weather pattern. 
They also discussed frustrations over the ship's only onboard anemometer. It wasn't functioning properly according to the crew, apparently aware of this for some time, and they did not find it reliable. A local anemometer is crucial in that it provides the ship with the most real-time, localized info possible on wind speed and direction. Bridge crew discussed the storm further, the third mate and chief mate even considering the possibility of Northwest Providence Channel and the Old Bahama Channel once again. Much like with aviation's Cockpit Resource Management, or CRM, Bridge Resource Management, BRM, is the same concept. It's an ongoing challenge in commercial shipping for subordinate bridge officers to have much say in vessel decision-making and for masters and captains to adequately consider their input. Bridge and Cockpit Resource Management mean the commanding crew genuinely take on board one another's input and either decide collectively on the best plan of action or the officer in charge otherwise makes a genuine informed decision based on the other's concerns. The opposite of an environment where what the leader says is what we do without question. Resource management, quote unquote, while admittedly sounds like just more made up corporate speak, is actually a big step towards effective, proven, modernized safety practices and training in the world of commercial transportation. It plays a major role in why modern commercial airline travel has become so safe. It translates roughly to the team members you're surrounded by. Yeah, they likely know a bit about what's going on. And in these critical moments, consider their input too. The ship had slowed down slightly, down to 19.4 knots from about 20 plus. We're going to get slammed tonight, said the chief mate to the able seaman, or AB, on duty. The AB is the crew member actually at the helm controls. Yeah, I was thinking that all through August, the AB replied, like it's been too quiet this season. The captain overhearing this, admitting the storm had, quote, morphed its ugly head, although he'd follow up with, tough to plan when you don't know, but we made a little diversion here referring to their slight southerly deviation. We're gonna, we're gonna be further south of the eye. We'll be about 60 miles south of the eye. It should be fine. We're gonna be, not should be, we're gonna be fine. He'd go on to lament stories of his experience in harsh weather in Alaskan waters and even the close run-in with Tropical Storm Erica, along with lamenting what he believed was the sturdiness of El Faro's, quote, solid hull and power plant. Davidson's presence was said to be very commanding in itself, and in the time period, Tote's company policies and safety training was completely lacking any sort of bridge resource management training or initiatives. Not necessarily unique to Tote, though, an ongoing issue throughout the industry. However, despite getting zero pushback from management a few weeks prior when he diverted for safety during Tropical Storm Erica, the captain would email the onshore group this time at either 10.22 a.m., as the email itself shows, or 12.22 p.m. Sources conflict on this with the NTSB stating 12.22 p.m. in their report. Also, the email itself states, good afternoon, while time stamped as 10.22 a.m. So, I'm mentioning this aspect because these are the sort of minute details I come across in these investigations that sometimes conflict and then I'm conflicted how to present it. Or, the email could have been in a queue, as they often are on ships like this, and then sent out the next time data packets are sent. Anyhow, the email would go out with standard updates about the voyage, very few updates about the hurricane's developments, the captain's intentions to continue on course, and that they were making good speed and so on. No mention of changing course for safety's sake, like they did for Erica. In fact, further confounding the investigation was the fact the captain did add, question, I would like to transit the old Bahama Channel on our return northbound leg to Jacksonville, Florida, period, question mark to which management promptly responded, diversion request understood and authorized. Thank you for the heads up. Historically, the evidence proves out the captain had full authority for management to make diversions and without posing them as a request. Joaquin had reached hurricane strength as early as 2 a.m. that same morning. Now, investigators can only speculate what was on the captain's mind, of course, in that he'd request a diversion only for their return trip to Jacksonville while their current trajectory risk driving them directly into the storm. But one major difference in this journey versus those previous was evidence that the captain had recently become aware, or at least felt, that for one reason or another, his job was on the line. Davidson had made clear, in the past, his desire to be transferred to captain on one of Tote's newest LNG-powered ships, one of those that would soon take over the Jacksonville to San Juan run. It's reported he was declined the position on his first attempt, 
but was still vying for a master position on the second LNG ship. It's held amongst investigators that his motivation to deliver in San Juan at or nearly on time was now much greater than before, regardless of management's willingness to allow diversions without questioning his authority. The captain and chief mate overheard that day on the bridge discussing how they both felt as though they were, quote, in line for the chopping block. Testimony from tote personnel pointed to the captain being made aware he was passed over in his first attempt to captain a new Marlin class vessel. Behind the scenes, from everything I've gathered, it appeared several key members in Tote's upper management were reconsidering on his second attempt, and even preparing an August 11 interview to give the good news in person to Davidson. However, this was on record as being halted sometime later in August or early September by Tote's director of labor relations and crewing manager on the grounds that the captain was negligent in some of the El Faro's critical steel repairs, neglecting disciplinary actions towards a chief mate, caught repeatedly and blatantly sleeping on duty, and that Davidson had personality conflicts amongst teammates in the past. All of this led to Tote deciding against Davidson's transfer, but according to the evidence, they hadn't yet made him aware of this second and ultimately final rejection. It's possible being left in the dark, especially after being declined once already, led to his negative outlook toward his future at Tote Maritime. The NTSB stating, quote, if the captain thought his performance on this trip would be a deciding factor in getting the job, it might have affected his decision making. He might have been more risk tolerant. That same morning, El Yunque, about 330 nautical miles southeast of El Faro, heading back to Jacksonville from San Juan, emailed Captain Davidson. Just wondering how you were doing with the hurricane out there. We sped up yesterday to get in front of it. It appears to be steadily intensifying and tracking to the southwest. The captain received this email at 10.02 a.m. and would respond to El Yunque at 11.08 a.m. I've been watching this system for the better part of a week. We did alter our direct route slightly more to the south, which will put Joaquin 65 nautical miles to the north of us at its CPA, or closest point of approach. Fortunately, we departed the dock in Jacks on time last evening. Making 20 knots doesn't hurt either. All departments have been duly noted, and we should be on the back side by 0800 October 1st. Their course change would put them to the west of the island of San Salvador, but this would provide only a few moments of protection at most as they pass the island's lee side. Second mate Daniel Randolph wrote in an email to her mother at about 10.15 a.m. We're heading straight into a hurricane. She would also be overheard on the bridge around noon. He's telling everybody down there, oh, it's not a bad storm. It's not so bad. It's not even that windy out. Seen worse. I think he's just trying to play it down because he realizes we shouldn't have come this way. Saving face. The weather was relatively calm in their local area, but the hurricane was gathering strength at an alarming rate. The captain would mention how erratic Joaquin was behaving based on information he received, much of this info delayed. But in all up-to-date forecast models, the cone of uncertainty made the hurricane a significant risk along their current path. And to be clear, Joaquin did prove to be one of the most erratic on record, defying the National Hurricane Center's initial forecasts and, in general, typical Atlantic Basin hurricane behavior. But by Tuesday the 29th at 11 a.m., Advisory No. 7 from the National Weather Service and NHC showed a warning area that would potentially track to the southwest. From then on, the warning area followed more closely to the actual route as it evolved from tropical storm to hurricane. The captain continually pulled forecasts and tracking data from the BVS system that was obsolete by several hours or more, instead of relying on SAT-C or other sources that investigators say would have been more timely. Yes, some of the info from warnings back on Tuesday morning would have provided conflicting information, but a full day and a half is quite a long time to reassess and ensure you're making the most informed decision. And regardless, Joaquin was still a tropical storm as far as the El Faro knew. The Bahamas, Turks, and others always on high alert during these situations. Any vessel in open waters to their northeast must be prepared to change course and make use of the many protective lees these islands offer. The second mate and on-duty AB were discussing El Yunque on its way back to Jacksonville as the ships passed each other at a distance of roughly 33 nautical miles. They're trying to get away from the storm too, the second mate said, the AB replying, nobody in their right mind would be driving into it. We are. <laughs> Yay. 70 miles south of it, the captain replied, correcting the two bridge crew, dismissing their concerns. 
By midday, the hurricane was producing 70 knot sustained winds. About 2.30 p.m., the bridge received two Securité warnings over maritime distress frequencies from Coast Guard aircraft. About as serious as warnings can get, the messages stressed hurricane warnings for the central Bahamas and that all mariners should, quote, use extreme caution. The captain did hear these and simply responded, wow, but did not change course. Just north of Great Abaco Island at this time, it would have been yet another opportunity to change course for one of their well-known alternate routes, the route they were nearing known as the Northeast Providence Channel. By 4.15 p.m., the AB on duty asked if they might turn around. No, 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 we're not going to turn around. We're not going to turn around, the captain barked back. About 5 p.m. and the bridge received an update on the Sat Sea Terminal. The National Hurricane Center provided an updated advisory. Joaquin now showed sustained winds of 75 knots and gusts up to 90 knots. By about 6.30 p.m., now 60 nautical miles from the Northeast Providence Channel entrance and 180 nautical miles northwest of Joaquin's eye, the captain and chief mate executed their planned slight course adjustment, one that would end up leading them, unknowingly I presume, even closer to the eye of the storm than otherwise. Captain Davidson would leave the bridge at about 8 p.m., the hurricane strengthening to more than 80 knot sustained winds by this time. After he boarded the boat, he was in despair about the conditions there. He told me it was dirty and hot because the air conditioning was not working. He was happy that he had managed to get a cabin with a fan. He also said he had never seen or worked on a hulk like this. While he was working, rust was falling into his eyes. He didn't go through any training about boat safety such as an evacuation drill. He wasn't telling me about weather conditions because he knew I was worrying a lot. During his voyage, there were two tropical storms I found out about only after they were over. He was trying to calm me down, telling me not to worry because the captain was prudent and in such situations, he would always steer in between islands, which was safer. Spouse of one of the Polish crewmen in a post-accident response. From the NTSB report, among the possible explanations for the captain's decision to continue on his course relates to his understanding of the circumstances, or as the NTSB puts it, his quote, mental model. A mental model is a person's internal representation of events in the real world. Research has shown that people tend to seek confirmation of their mental models. From the beginning, the captain expected the storm to quote, turn north, and that they would quote, stay on the back side of it, or to the south. The NTSB went on to say, Another possible explanation is that the captain could have been normalizing the risk. When someone has experienced a risky situation and emerged without harm, it's not uncommon for that person to repeat the decision or to take the same risks again, end quote. I'd also add that it's possible a successful deviation to avoid Erica may have ended up feeling like what I'd refer to as overkill to then repeat again so soon. Like several tornado warnings in a row in the springtime, eventually you just start feeling annoyed gathering the family and sitting in the basement for the 15th time. The same principle, unfortunately, can apply to complacency in workplace safety. All this in addition to evidence pointing at the captain continually relying on weather info delayed by hours, rather than making the effort to ensure his info was as up-to-date as possible. However, the choice to avoid Erica, though, was made so far in advance that in my summation, the caution displayed at that time didn't force the vessel into a need for absolute up-to-the-minute or critical last-minute decision-making, which would be evidence that the captain was a man of caution in that instance, as many who knew him insist. But the Voyage Data Recorder, or VDR, on this fateful journey proved differently, whether it was out of character for him or otherwise. That day, Davidson had also spent time equivocating and to an extent downplaying the weather they'd be up against, comparing it to what he faced during his days in Alaskan waters. He also lamented being aboard other row-row vessels in rough conditions in the North Atlantic as well, failing to mention, though, that he didn't serve as captain in most of those encounters. If you're a fan of the channel, you know all too well the dangers in Alaskan waters and the North Atlantic. As deadly as those waters are, each set of circumstances is different. The ship type, size and condition, the cargo carried, the types of storms, the route options, time allotted to change course, every situation is unique. As night set in and the Alfaro pressed on, the bridge officers would discuss amongst themselves possible deviations, with those most concerned even calling down to the captain's quarters. He didn't return to the bridge though, just responded over the ship's phone that they need to remain on course 
and that he expected to not encounter the storm until about 4 a.m. at the earliest. From the NTSB, the VDR transcript contains many examples of how the ship's hierarchical structure influenced the flow of communications. The helmsmen frequently voiced their concerns to the junior officers, but never in the presence of the captain. It doesn't really feel like we're going in near a hurricane. When you go outside and there's hardly any wind, we're going 20 knots. I don't know. I might call the captain here shortly if he doesn't come up. I don't know how he can sleep knowing all of this. Mariners be advised. Hurricane Joaquin has been upgraded to Category 3. Oh my god. When the second mate called down to the stateroom this time at 1.20 a.m., warning the captain of the hurricane's upgrade to Category 3 and their path potentially running them straight through, she hung up the phone, presumably in disappointment, turning to the AB at the helm. He said to run it. Driving directly into the storm now, the first signs of winds and rough seas started about 1.30 a.m. as they exited San Salvador's protective lee side. 55 knot winds with 14 foot swells. The Alfaro also lost a bit more speed. At 2.11 a.m., the second mate noticed waves sweeping over the bow. Green water remaining on deck and the AB heard, quote, some clanking going on. Green water is a nautical term used to indicate a quantity of water remaining on deck after a large wave. Ship decks are designed to drain and shed water rapidly from waves, to a point, so the amount it would take to notice accumulation on a ship of this size would be significant. By 2.15 a.m., still pushing the engines at or near their maximum, average speed had dropped to about 16 knots. 35 minutes later and the clanking had turned to a much more concerning internal thumping. The sounds of either containers falling or cargo breaking free below decks. The off-course alarm rang on the bridge at about 2.54 a.m., the AB at the helm confirming they were being pushed off course by the winds and swells. The alarm was set to sound once the vessel goes off by 3 degrees. The second mate made corrections to keep El Faro on course. At 3.44 a.m., the vessel had slowed to about 13 knots. Around this time, the chief mate would arrive on the bridge to relieve the second mate. After roughly four minutes of discussion between the two, and still no sign of the captain, the second mate departed the bridge and sent out a few emails to friends and family. So, we are heading into the hurricane right now, full force. Tried to alter our course to avoid it, but he's on the warpath. Bad seas and really bad winds. Hope to talk to you Friday. Not sure if you have been following the weather at all, but there is a hurricane out here and we are heading straight into it. Category 3 last we checked. Winds are super bad and seas are not great. Love to everyone. With what the crew perceived was either a broken or otherwise unreliable anemometer, and I say perceived because investigators pointed out that the voyage data recorder was able to record wind speeds, the crew had no definitive idea, or so they thought, which directions the winds were pushing and had to gauge by the relative struggles to keep the ship on course. The AB stating, It's hard to tell which way the wind's blowing, huh? I assume we're heeling to starboard, blowing port to starboard. At 3.55 a.m., an assistant engineer from below decks came up to the bridge and reported seeing some electrical cords cut on the second deck. There were a handful of refrigerated containers on deck two as well, and their cables, strung about loosely throughout, were frequently disorganized and not run correctly. Vessel speed soon dropped to 10 knots. When the AB asked the chief mate about wind speed, he replied, I don't have any idea. We don't have any instrument that can measure it. The captain finally arrived back on the bridge at about 4.09 a.m., stating, There's nothing bad about this ride, sleeping like a baby. The captain and chief mate agreeing, quote, This was every day in Alaska. With the wind and waves sweeping over the vessel from port to starboard and steadily increasing in strength, the El Faro had developed a starboard list up to 15 degrees, all while gradually losing speed. The trailers carried below decks on the Ponce-class vessels don't simply rest on their landing gear after being uncoupled from a tractor. Instead, loaders lock the kingpin and rest the nose of the trailer onto what's called a rowlock box, with the tail of the trailer lashed to standard vehicle anchor points. The rowlock boxes are intended to be anchored directly atop what's called a button, a socket fixed into the deck specifically for this purpose. However, some trailers would get loaded off-button, due to capacity or specifically on the El Faro, there were too few of these sockets on deck two for the amount of trailers they would carry. With the trailer landed off button instead, 
the roll lock box would get lashed down to nearby standard lashing points. After investigators calculated, the trailers loaded with heavier cargo in this manner were discovered to have been susceptible to breaking free more easily if the list was prolonged or became great enough. Anywhere from at least 3 to 40 trailers were loaded in this manner, and potentially breaking free could have also caused a domino effect against any other cargo in their path. All of the Roro vehicles aboard these Ponce class ships, and likely many others, rely of course on their lashings, and the trailers rely on both lashings and rollock boxes. But both of these models also rely on a minimum coefficient of friction between the rubber tires and decking they're in contact with. Once water accumulates on deck enough to interfere with each tire's contact patch, any additional hold this provided is lost, and the lashings are then bearing at or near 100% of the load, making even a slight list to one side a larger issue. Many passenger vehicles aboard the Alfaro, like the off-button trailers, were also at greater risk of breaking free due to being secured incorrectly. As this diagram illustrates, each vehicle should be lashed at all four corners, either each tire wrapped or tow-eye hooked, and then attached directly to the D-ring anchors integrated into the deck itself. However, as evidenced by the El Yunque, it was likely the Alfaro utilized the same haphazard method of instead running lengths of chain between each deck anchor, likely because the deck had too few built in and then anchoring the vehicles to those chains. It speaks for itself why these somewhat loose lengths of chain would provide much less hold than four anchors directly on deck. In addition, you can see the location these El Yunque photos were taken, where these cars are lashed in this half-assed manner, deep in the bottom holds, likely the same practice aboard El Faro. As the vessel heeled to starboard and didn't recover due to, undoubtedly, hours of massive sustained winds and swells blowing from port to starboard, it remains in question to this day whether seawater was already slowly accumulating below decks. Seawater that could have down flooded via any of several potential paths. We'll never know for sure if or where the down flooding initiated during the starboard list, but the Marine Board of Investigation and NTSB cross-checked much of this in thorough inspections of sister ship El Yunque soon after. Keep in mind, El Yunque was similar to El Faro in many aspects, also operated, loaded, and maintained under very similar conditions. Floodwater could have slowly entered initially through potential hull breaches due to corrosion, watertight openings meant to be closed while underway, potentially left open or just not watertight due to lack of maintenance. The cargo hold ventilation system with louvered openings on the air supply blisters that led directly to bottom holds. A critical vulnerability if water were able to find its way through the baffles due to being open or otherwise rusted and not watertight. Former tow crew members testifying later that it was common practice to leave these open unless there was an actual fire in the cargo holds, even in heavy weather. In addition, down flooding created a possibility of those aforementioned vehicles breaking free down on deck four and damaging emergency fire pumping, potentially early on. If so, this would lead to seawater freely flowing into this bottom compartment, also known in the industry as the seawater communicating. Generally speaking though, the second deck on these Ponce class vessels is an open deck, allowing seawater in, then intended to drain or shed just as rapidly. But to keep this deck water tight and prevent down flooding into the holds beneath, hatches that allow crew passage via ladders between the decks, known as scuttles, need to be closed and dogged. Dogged meaning turning the crank wheel to fasten them securely. If any of these scuttles weren't watertight, once the second deck becomes swamped, water can then flood, essentially, all the way down to deck four, as deck three was perforated for ventilation by design. Struggling to maintain course in the storm, the vessel's speed fell to nine knots by about 4.15 a.m. Being pushed extra hard meant the engine crew had to, quote, blow the tubes several times. This was a somewhat lengthy process and the need for it meant engine power was reduced until the procedure was complete each time. And more importantly, the Alfaro's main lubrication oil sump hadn't been maintained at the recommended 27-inch minimum fill level. Because the levels were low in the main sump, the prolonged starboard list was thought to be giving the crew and engineering intermittent problems in keeping it primed. The oil system provided the lubrication needed for the steam turbines and main reduction gear. Keeping oil flowing uninterrupted is crucial to just about any engine, really, and the Alfaro's was no exception. Should oil pressure be lost entirely, it would, quote, quickly fail and the ship would suffer an irreparable propulsion casualty. 
Additionally, if propulsion were to be lost, typically a ship would then be adrift, at the mercy of currents, winds, and waves. In the Alfaro's case, they'd plunged deep into a soon-to-be Category 4 hurricane, keeping a ship like this oriented in any direction that would aid in remaining afloat requires propulsion. There's just not enough steering authority without it. Losing power, listing heavily, and going adrift is simply not a combination to make it through a storm of this magnitude. In the event of pressure loss, about eight minutes of reserve oil would gravity feed directly into the main engine bearings. At about 4.34 a.m., the captain went to check that the galley was secured. The chief mate was soon on the phone with the chief engineer who mentioned seeing a trailer leaning over on deck two, forward of the bridge, and a few moments later informed them of issues with the quote, list and oil levels. With the captain back on the bridge at 4.43 a.m., he ordered the vessel turn northward, directly into the wind, to help take the list off. The oil sumps are acting up, he said as he took the con. The vessel's speed dropped to about 7.5 knots. The captain went below again soon after to check the BVS and sat sea weather updates. Getting conflicting reports, he said, returning to the bridge at about 5.02. The captain had downloaded info via BVS likely out of date once again, this time by about 12 hours, weather reports from that previous afternoon. The Sat Sea Terminal recently received advisories and updates on the storm's position, more accurate to real time, and showed sustained winds of 105 knots, gusts of 130, and based on the Alfaro's current position, Joaquin's eye was now only 11 miles southeast. An update was made available by the BVS system at 5.03 a.m. with this more current info, but the captain wouldn't end up downloading this until about an hour later. The experienced tote engineer supervising the Polish riding crew appeared on the bridge about 5.10 a.m. concerned about the situation, especially after he'd heard, quote, things slapping around on deck two. I've never seen it list like this. I've never seen it hang like this, he said. Also aware of the low oil pressure situation, he explained the importance of listing affecting oil pressure. About 5.15 a.m., the vessel's speed now down to 5.8 knots, the list 18 degrees to starboard. Captain Davidson overheard saying, only gonna get better from here, we're on the back side of it. At 5.30 a.m., the chief mate mentioned taking on water on the stern, and about 10 minutes later, speed had decreased to just over four knots. Soon after, the captain received an urgent call about water in hold three and yelled out to the bridge crew, we got cars loose. So where's the water from? Are we able to pump the bilges? The chief mate asked engineering from another phone. The only way to do a counter on this is to fill the port side ramp tank up. The captain, referring to the aft deep tanks, one of these bottommost tanks transferred from starboard to port in an effort to correct the list or heal. The chief mate left the bridge with the radio to get eyes on the flooding in hold three. At 5.52 a.m., the captain received word from below decks that the source of down flooding was a wide open scuttle on deck two. He ordered the Alfaro to come about even further now, to a heading of 350 degrees, and put the wind directly on the starboard side, a maneuver intended to enable crew access to the flooded side of deck two, where the unsecured starboard scuttle was now underwater. From the NTSB, because the suction for the lubricating oil service pump was located in the starboard aft section of the sump, a port list with a forward trim would be the worst case scenario for exposing the suction bell mouth, which would result in a loss of lubricating oil to the main engine. This decision by the captain would unfortunately remove what little possibility the Alfaro had to stay afloat. The already intermittent power from the struggling engine now put at further risk as the port list moved the oil sump tank into the worst orientation possible, soon to lose prime and oil pressure entirely, putting the engine at risk of catastrophic failure amongst critical moving parts relying on lubrication. Old 3 was now flooded by up to 20%. This, combined with the transfer of ballast from starboard to port in the aft tanks just prior to their turn. I think we just lost the plant. The captain was heard saying at about 6.10 a.m., as the vessel's forward speed was now non-existent. The only speed registering on radar and the VDR's parametric data was due to being pushed around by the conditions. By about 6.15 a.m. October 1st, fully engulfed by a raging hurricane, adrift and surrounded by open ocean 15,000 feet deep, this tired, rusted hulk of a cargo ship was put into what many would consider the worst-case scenario imaginable.
The portside list would quickly exceed that of the previous list to starboard. For the next roughly 45 minutes, the captain would be speaking over the phone with engineering and potentially others below decks, ordering the now full aft tanks on the port side transferred back over to starboard, and ordering, quote, everybody up to the bridge and going back and forth over the phone with the engine room. They're going to get that boiler back up online any second, he stated in one of his calls. El Faro's bow was pointed northwest as the sun rose, but the ship was actually traveling southwest at about 6.7 knots being pushed sideways by wind and waves. The ship's radar had also been knocked out by the storm around this time as well. At 6.59 a.m., the first indication of any distress was via voicemail left by the captain with their, quote, designated person ashore, or DPA, at Tote's offices. Cap, Cap Davidson, Thursday morning, 0700. We have a navigational incident. Um, I'll keep it short. A uh, scuttle popped open on two decks, and we were had some three communication from water go down to three, three old. Had a pretty good list. I want to uh, just touch and contact you verbally here. Everybody's safe, um, yeah, but I want to talk to you. The Alfaro's assigned DPA was actually out of the office for a few days. In addition, according to investigators, no other shoreside tote personnel were actively monitoring El Faro's position in relation to the hurricane. About five minutes later, and he then phoned Tote's emergency call center, the captain asking for a QI, or qualified individual. The, t the, the clock is ticking. Can I please speak with a QI? I have a marine emergency and I would like to speak to a QI. We had a, a, a hull breach, a scuttle blew open during a storm. We have water down in three holes with a heavy lift. We've lost the main propulsion unit. The engineers cannot get it going. Can I speak with a QI, please? Yes, thank you so much. One moment. While the captain was on the line with corporate, the chief engineer called up to the bridge again, and the second mate, back on the bridge now, answered, heard telling him, The wind is pushing us over. There's nothing we can do for him up here. She also suggested moving more ballast. Tote's emergency phone number was available 24 hours a day, but investigators discovered later personnel at these numbers weren't even trained in heavy weather scenarios or similar emergencies, like loss of stability, fire at sea, or vessel grounding. However, at the same time, Tote's emergency response manual included only two categories in which to utilize the call center oil spill response, and security emergencies. There were no instructions that investigators found regarding adverse weather, flooding, loss of stability, cargo shifting, or abandoned ship. Tote's shortcomings aside, and despite their many areas needing better training and improvement, in the moment, it is ultimately a shipmaster's responsibility to ensure the safety of their vessel. The second mate was finally instructed by the captain to send out distress messages at 7.12 a.m., She'd actually prepared them at 6.31 a.m., but awaited the captain's approval to send. These messages contained reports of flooding, cargo adrift, time, and vessel position, and went out via the Global Maritime Distress and Safety System and Ship Security Alert System, both using satellite and digital protocols. The distress messages were received by the U.S. Coast Guard Atlantic Area Command Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. Still struggling with damage control and insisting up until about 7.15 a.m. they were, quote, going to be fine, the captain wouldn't ring the general alarm until 7.26 a.m. The port side had been swamped as the list grew to 20 plus degrees. The water line was well over all of what would have been potential down flooding openings on this side, overwhelmed and pouring in like a dam giving way. With reports of cars floating, quote, bobbing around in hold three, the chief mate reporting, quote, something hitting the fire main on deck four, reports of water chest deep on deck two, even reports of water sloshing in the engine room now, pouring in through ventilation ducts. The engineering team was scrambling to pump out hold three, keep up with the bridge's orders to transfer ballast back and forth between the aft tanks, dewater the engineering compartment now, stay in contact with the bridge, and all the while struggling to get the engine itself back online. At about 7.25 a.m., a representative from Tote called the Coast Guard Atlantic Area Command Center to report El Faro's situation. The command center he reached passed the info along to Coast Guard District 7 Command Center in Miami, Florida. Based on the info provided, District 7 Command Center 
return the tote representative's call to update him. Can you tell me what the uh, what the plans what are you planning on doing now? Um, so right now, right now, based off of all the information that you've uh, that you've provided me, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not in the distress phase currently uh, because okay. because they're not at risk of sinking. Since the ship had reached the point of no return, mustering should have taken place quite some time before this point. The captain's insistence on either his mental model still carrying them through, or otherwise just not understanding the full extent of damage and urgency, meant they were still aboard far too late in the process. In addition, the unfortunate, neglected state of this vessel didn't stop at engine oil and a rusty superstructure. Safety equipment and training on board was also seen as something of an afterthought. There were two open-style lifeboats on gravity davit launchers, an obsolete style of lifeboat only allowed, at least by U.S. regulations, to be used on ships constructed before July 1986, and four 25-person life rafts, two on each side, near the lifeboats. In the ship's state, though, the starboard side group would have been inaccessible due to the ship's list. Attempting to release either, it would be a deadly tumble down the raised, tilted side. The port side group would have needed to be accessed early on, before becoming submerged, either that or boarded after individuals swim clear of the sinking ship, and that's if the life vessels release and or inflate on their own, as intended when submerged. Immersion suits were located in each crew member's berth along with spares in the engine room at the bow and internal storeroom. A former Polish riding crew member from an earlier voyage described in an interview later how they were never instructed in donning immersion suits, their location, or emergency procedures in general. When the tote riding crew supervisor called up to the bridge, he had just taken a look down into hold three through the scuttle above. Extremely concerned, he asked the captain what their downflitting angle was. I don't have an answer. I mean, we still got reserve buoyancy and stability. This was around 7.25 a.m., the ship 14 minutes away from being completely submerged. The captain then notified the rest of the ship that he'd be ringing the general alarm, but to not immediately abandon and then telling the chief mate to quote, make sure that everyone has their immersion suits. Keep in mind, in engineering especially, abandoning takes much longer as they need to make their way up three to four decks. Where are my emergency contact numbers? The captain yelled to the second mate. Hanging up on the, by the chair. The captain apparently still focused on making emergency calls via phone. We got containers in the water, he yelled soon after, noticing the mayhem just outside. There was a sudden scramble for the next few minutes on the bridge amongst officers trying to find life preservers and immersion suits. The second mate was the first to ask if she could go fetch life preservers. She'd apparently memorized their nearest location to the bridge. It's unknown if she was referring to gathering immersion suits or just life vests. The captain shouting in the meantime, Where are the life preservers? Here? Where are the life preservers on the bridge? I'm a goner. The AB cried. No, you're not. The captain yelled and followed up. It's time to come this way. These were the final words overheard by the Voyage data recorder when it ceased recording at 7.39 a.m., Thursday, October 1st. VDRs cease recording data and audio once their vessel is submerged. Their protective capsule, designed to withstand extreme pressure, shock, impact, and heat, either releasing it to float freely away from the vessel or the entire unit breaking free in hopes to get clear. The Alfaro's VDR was the latter type, breaking away but not floating. Instead, similar to a black box on an airplane, an archive of data for investigators to comb through only once it's recovered in the wreckage. The Emergency Position Indicating Radio Beacon, or EPIRB, operates on a similar premise in that it breaks free once the vessel is submerged. However, these are designed to float and begin transmitting, or pinging, to satellites in low Earth orbit. The Alfaro's version of EPIRB, designed to give rescuers a position with only roughly two miles accuracy. Low Earth orbit satellites aren't everywhere at all times though, and the next one to pass over within view would be about 30 minutes after pinging started. The EPIRB only transmitted for about 24 minutes. In addition, the approximate 500 mile wide storm was not letting up, reaching category four status around the same time with sustained winds of 115 knots. Unfortunately, the storm was so dangerous and loitered so long in the general area that immediate rescue just wouldn't be possible. The only craft able to deploy toward the last known position, a position provided by the emergency calls and messages, were the hurricane hunters. 
of their two overflights around roughly 10.30 a.m., reportedly no lower than 10,000 feet due to weather. No visual assessment was possible, and all radio callouts to El Faro went unanswered. At 11.06 a.m., Coast Guard Command requested the nearest vessel, Emerald Express, render assistance and proceed to El Faro's last known coordinates. Emerald Express, simply a modified landing craft, understandably refused, as they were having struggles of their own in just trying to ride out the storm in the lee of Acklands and Crooked Islands. They attempted several callouts to the stricken vessel, though, the Express and Hurricane Hunter, hearing each other's radio calls, but nothing from El Faro. The hurricane would loiter and gain strength over the next day and a half, reaching sustained wind speeds of 130 knots. No one, not even the U.S. Coast Guard, as brave as their rescue crews are, dared to get within less than 100 nautical miles of the last known position. Those that tried, a Coast Guard C-130, making the closest attempt that day, flying at 3,000 feet and getting within 100 nautical miles of El Faro's last known position on the morning of Friday, October 2nd. The aircraft sustained damage due to the weather, and leaking fuel had to return to base in Florida. At 9.05 a.m., Coast Guard Command would cancel all planned El Faro search and rescue sorties for the remainder of Friday. The Coast Guard explaining that even if they did send an MH-60 helicopter, their only method of retrieving survivors at the current time, the helicopter crew would be flying into near 140 knot winds. This would mean the aircraft would only be traveling at an actual speed of 40 knots, for example. In addition, there was no visual aid coming from the C-130s or Hurricane Hunters. Due to drift, wind, and waves carrying any potential survivors away from the last known position, no one yet knew precisely where to look. Throughout Friday, though, the Coast Guard would gather the following initial resources in preparation for when the storm subsided. Cutter Northland sent to the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay for fueling and provisions. Three MH-60s throughout the Bahamas, Turks, and Andros Islands staged and waiting, the Coast Guard C-130s already prepped and awaiting redeployment. Other resources that would eventually aid in the search, U.S. Coast Guard Cutters Resolute and Charles Sexton, a U.S. Coast Guard C-144 and MH-65 Dolphin, a U.S. Air Force C-130 and J-STARS aircraft, along with the U.S. Navy P-8 Poseidon. After seven sorties once weather permitted, totaling 28 hours worth of searching on Saturday, October 3rd, Battling the still difficult weather conditions left in Joaquin's wake, no sign of survivors were found. A hurricane hunter spotted initially a large oil sheen and two debris fields northeast of Crooked Island. An MH-60 spotted an El Faro life ring amidst debris comprised of mostly packaging materials in the first debris patch. The next day, Sunday, October 4th, Cutter Northland arrived on scene at about 1 p.m. and assumed the duty of on-scene command. Three tugboats chartered by Tote arrived to assist, and El Yunque, returning to San Juan from Jacksonville, would aid in search as they transited the area as well, recovering another El Faro life ring. The Navy's P-8 Poseidon spotted what they reported was two life rafts, one of which turning out to actually be the El Faro's starboard lifeboat. The Northland arrived at the first, about 18 nautical miles from El Faro's last known position. The ship's rescue swimmer approached, only to discover the life raft was empty. Cutter Northland would sink the empty life raft to prevent rediscovery confusion. A tugboat of Tote Maritime's chartered fleet then approached the starboard lifeboat. Floating bow pointed up, the tug was too small to recover it. Tote would charter support vessel Megan Bale to haul it up and deliver it to the port of Miami for Coast Guard inspection. Investigators concluding, through interviews with the boat's manufacturer, that the damage was, quote, indicative of a fall and not of a lifeboat actually being released. At 4.57 p.m. on Sunday, October 4th, the P-8 Poseidon spotted a bright orange immersion suit about 40 nautical miles west-northwest of the El Faro's last known position. An MH-60 crew used the info and located the suit about an hour and a half later. Their rescue swimmer found it contained human remains in an advanced state of decomposition, too far along for the swimmer to determine identity or even gender. However, before they could haul the victim up, an urgent call came through that the Poseidon crew discovered another immersion suit about 30 nautical miles away. This time, the Poseidon thought they may have also seen a person in the suit waving their arms. The MH-60 crew pulled up their rescue swimmer and dropped a self-locating datum marker buoy in hopes to later retrieve them. 
The Hilo crew proceeded as quickly as possible to the location of the potential survivor, but they were unable to locate them, unfortunately. And as night was falling, they attempted to return to the marker for the deceased sailor, but the marker had failed to transmit properly, and they were unable to relocate the victim. On the morning of day 5, October 5th, the U.S. Air Force's J-STARS, or Joint Surveillance Target Attack Radar System Aircraft, was able to conduct detailed, high-altitude sweeps of about 19,300 square miles at a time. This crew provided confirmation of all debris fields and that there were no large vessels to be found in the search area. This gave the Coast Guard the confirmation they needed to declare the Alfaro had sunk and that it was now considered a major marine casualty. As conditions continued to improve, the P-8 Poseidon crew were able to fly lower and lower in search of smaller objects. At an altitude of 2,500 feet, the Navy aircraft was crucial in spotting three more Alfaro life rings. These flotation devices then recovered by Cutter Resolute and the tugboat Sentry. Tuesday, Day 6, October 6th, as the search continued by multiple resources in the area, the Cutter Charles Sexton recovered an empty immersion suit stenciled El Faro. Wednesday, October 7th, seven days in, after searches again from 8 a.m. to sunset, the Charles Sexton retrieved another empty immersion suit, but there were otherwise still no significant sightings. The search would officially be suspended that evening. Survival time in these conditions was estimated to be 120 hours and would-be rescuers had reached the 154-hour mark since the time of sinking. 50 air and surface sorties covering 195,601 square miles. The ship had gone down in waters 15,000 feet or nearly 3 miles deep, eliminating the possibility of rescue diving altogether. Wednesday, October 14, 2015, the Coast Guard Sector Commander in Jacksonville, Florida, declared all 33 persons on board the Alfaro missing and presumed deceased. Another victim of Hurricane Joaquin was the MV Minuche. Reports are scant on this one, but the Minuche was reportedly a 212-foot cargo vessel that developed a major list in the storm off the coast of Haiti on October 1st at about 10 p.m. Fortunately, the reported 12 crew, some reports say 14 to 15, were able to abandon the ship safely and were rescued by a U.S. Coast Guard cutter that was diverted, sending their helicopter out to retrieve all survivors from their life raft on what looks to be the same night, 2 a.m., October 2nd. This area of the Caribbean was much less deadly than the Alfaro's last known position, still a harrowing rescue nonetheless. In order to make the Alfaro findings possible, it was a painstaking two-year cooperative investigation between the NTSB, the Coast Guard, their Marine Board of Investigation, Tote Maritime, family members, former colleagues, Jacksonville San Juan port personnel, the list goes on. The Alfaro was at a depth too great to inspect thoroughly, but with the help of U.S. Navy ship Apache, with a ping locator, side scan sonar, and a remote operated vehicle, Curve 21, they could at least get started. The Apache would arrive on October 23rd, with first priority being to ping locate the voyage data recorder. The design of Alfaro's VDR meant it should have been pinging with its acoustic beacon for this reason, but they heard nothing. It wasn't until October 31st that they finally located some of the wreckage via side scan sonar. The debris field was vast, with the main vessel structure sitting upright on the bottom. Upon closer inspection, though, they discovered the entire bridge and mast were missing. This was a problem because the VDR was atop the bridge near the mast. Curve 21's video footage was crucial to much of the investigation, but the Apache needed to depart on November 15th. The VDR and ship's bridge still yet to be found. The NTSB needed a dynamic positioning vessel, one that could stay on station even in bad weather, and both remotely survey and stream live to NTSB headquarters complex underwater search operations. In a joint investigation including the University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center, the NTSB, Verizon, and the National Oceanographic Laboratory System, the research vessel Atlantis would be available in April of 2016. Their ROV Sentry was able to expand on Apache's previous findings and located both the missing bridge mast and VDR nearby. A third mission, though, in August of 2016 was required to actually retrieve the VDR. The Apache returned with Curve 21, refitted this time, and successfully hauled up the Voyage Data Recorder. 
Alfaro's VDR provided the evidence needed to find out what really happened, leading up to and on that fateful October morning. The El Yunque also provided crucial evidence needed, as that vessel had its own long, well-concealed story to tell of neglect and half-measures. The El Yunque coming under Coast Guard inspection and audit in February of 2016, crucial to the investigation, but also found to be out of compliance. Permanent repairs were ordered to cargo hold three ventilation ducts within 30 days, due to excessive corrosion. The El Yunque soon transferred to Seattle by tote for its planned conversion back to Alaska service in March. It was audited again by the Coast Guard traveling inspectors, finding even more deficiencies and half measures that they just could not overlook. Uncorrected wastage, more corrosion, even in the ventilation ducts, to the cargo holds still. Tote gave up and scrapped El Yunque, the anvil by August of 2016. This video has gotten extremely long, so I will be following up with an episode to expand upon the safety recommendations that came as a result, along with some other crucial lessons learned and more. In closing, although investigators will likely never fully conclude where the down flooding initiated, due to the ship's overall condition being allowed to deteriorate for years, which wasn't exactly a secret, lacking safety culture, equipment, and emergency training, Lacking adherence to watertight integrity, proper cargo arrangement, securing and overall stability needs, due to an ongoing demanding schedule of the Ponce fleet, while personnel turmoil and shifting company priorities left the vessels with overworked onshore and onboard crews, due to poor culture and working environments that discouraged teamwork and a captain unwilling to engage in bridge resource management, due to poor navigational decision making both in overall route and in response to conditions due to the captain's several hours of blatant indifference through the night of September 30th into the early hours of October 1st. By the time the El Faro plunged directly into Hurricane Joaquin, the staggering amount of links in this years-long chain of failure were so firmly in place that the chances of making it through a Category 4 storm were slim to none. As the El Yunque passed over the El Faro's last known position during a routine voyage, Ten days after sinking on October 11, 2015, a small memorial was held by the crew. Lighthouse-style El Faro memorials can be found near the Dames Point Park in Jacksonville and along the waterfront in the port of San Juan. Supporters of this channel help make content like this possible, and a special thanks goes out to those top-tier Patreon supporters. Paul R., Nathan F., Lil Tony, Kenneth P., Jeremy H., Jenny E., Dr. Jen, Andrew M., and Alex W. Don't forget, you're important, and your safety matters.